Okay, welcome back everybody. Two fantastic clinics there, uh, kicking off the, the Christmas show. I'm really, really excited to bring you the next clinic. I've, I've wanted to do uh, some rail fanning clinics uh, since we've really started back in April. Um, I think it's a really important uh, dynamic to the hobby and it's a, it's a good way for younger people to get involved. So talking to younger people, we've rolled out Jordan, um, who has uh, has been around with NMREX since the early days, pre the first uh, the first session. It was me and Jordan talking uh, one evening that uh, with um, Martin and uh, Brad that got all this kicked off and speed and everybody got involved and it was great. So um, as a founding member of NMREX, um, we've known Jordan for quite a while. We know that Jordan is an avid rail fan and has been has been so since he was seven years old. So he has thousands and thousands of photographs. In fact, if me in the UK says to Jordan, can you get me a photograph of a particular train that I want to model, nine times out of 10, Jordan's got it for me. So uh, fantastic guy, great, great knowledge in your head for such a young, young guy. And uh, so today we're going to be sharing Jordan's winter time rail running, rail fanning, rail running, rail fanning photographs. Um, fantastic stuff. The snow and ice and all nice things that people in Australia long for but don't get. Um, I don't believe there's any snowmen. I think we failed in that one and maybe didn't brief you on that until just now. Um, but there's everything else that you could wish for. So uh, I've seen this, I've seen this what's coming. I'm really, really excited. I've been helping Jordan get this ready over the last couple of days. Um, so without any more, let's welcome Jordan Kramer. Jordan, over to you, pal. How's it doing? How y'all doing tonight? This is a small snippet of what I have to offer. And it is a presentation, it's called Real Fanning in Winter. And where I'm from, I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. Which and the area we're covering tonight is the area in the red. So you got Chicago up here to, because everybody knows where Chicago's at. And Cincinnati's right down in here. Well, I cover most of the lines going north out of Cincinnati. And mainly the lines, the line coming out of Richmond, Indiana, going down through Hamilton. It's called the Norfolk Southern Newcastle District. And it is a very busy main line. It's the main line for NS trains coming out of Atlanta going to Chicago. And we've broken it up into sections such as right in here. This is the Western part of the area I've covered. And this is from a small town called Millville, Indiana to Walnut Level, Indiana. And Walnut Level, Indiana is not a town. It's actually a passing siding on the Norfolk Southern. And first picture is of NS375 at Walnut Level. Oh, this is what they would consider the east end of the siding. And if you notice, you do have a dash, it's a dash nine liter, GE dash nine liter. And also behind it is a dash nine. Now, if you notice in the photo, this is early winter. You're starting to get into this where there's still some leaves on the trees, but not as much as, but they've started falling as more rapidly than when they were at fall. Next one is heading east, west from there. This is a little town called Hagerstown, Indiana. And this is where the Norfolk Southern Newcastle District starts up another one of the grades to get up onto flatlands of Indiana, basically. It's coming out of the Whitewater River, Whitewater River Valley. And this was taken, this is NS-174. NS-174 was, up until three weeks ago, a... Birmingham, Alabama to Elkhart, Indiana freight. Typically always ran in the morning and that's when most of these photos were taken was in the morning time. And it was a mixed freight as you can see by in this photo where you have the hopper cars right behind the head end. Next one is 173, NS-173 even further west of the location, 
And again, you have two of the NS-9s. NS in the 90s ordered, I want to say, around a 1,000 of these locomotives to replace older and worn-out motive power. And NS-173 was Elkhart, Indiana, to Birmingham, Alabama freight. Always a fun train to chase because you had all the steel loads coming out of Chicago heading down to Birmingham. And uh, we're back to NS-174, but this is at Millville, Indiana. Again, you can see just how varied, for, varied these trains are. I mean, you got two uh, um, rotary hoppers behind the head end and then mixed freight behind that. And Millville, Indiana is actually notable for being home of the birthplace of one of the Wright brothers. I can't remember if it's um, Orville or Wilbur. I think it's Wilbur, though. Again, the other thing to notice in this photo is look, look at the ballast profile. It's very nice and tidy. And most modern railway railroads you'll see unless it's on a fill the ballast profile's nice and tidy and it was actually just around sunrise as you can see in the background this is walnut level looking the opposite direction in blizzard conditions um this is a great story on this one because me and my Best friend Ryan were out rail fanning, and we knew there was snow in the area. And me being the type of person who loves snow was like, I want to get out and do rail fanning in this. I want to get out and do rail fanning in this. And we picked one of the best snowstorms I have ever rail fanned in. I think we saw at least 10 trains that day in various conditions. But again, this is, if you look at it, you see even more reasons why to model, you could model the um, modern era and have a little bit of everything. Because tucked behind the NS units, the CXX unit on run through power. And 55, NS 55G is a grain train, empty grain train. It's a symbol for every, basically, it can go anywhere on the NS system. And I believe the leader is a, SD-70 ACE. So that concludes that area of the western west of Richmond. Now we come into the part of between the east end of the Richmond siding, which is right here to right, right across the state line into Ohio. It's one of my favorite areas to rail fan. There's two passing sightings within close proximity, and there's typically always two trains about to meet on this area. So we decided we were going to chase 173 after we got that photo from previous. And again, snow, it was snowing even harder at this point. One thing to point out on this is both these locomotives are dash nine are dash nines. The biggest difference with them is the first, the lead locomotive is in the older as delivered paint scheme. The second locomotive is in the 2004, 2006 thoroughbred horse paint scheme. And if you notice the dash nine in the back still has the GE tat um sticker on the back so it's sli it's slight and this was 20 minutes later and on the way there if you notice the chase car i took a turn in the snow and i tried to i should say it was coming down there was already about a about six inches of snow on the ground and my car decided no you're going to go straight and I came about three inches 
from uh, um, from this pole right here. There's a little yellow connector that goes down and holds it into the ground. I nearly hit that from coming around the curve at, I want to say, 20 miles an hour. Um, so notice it does say 55G. This was an empty grain train coming south from an ethanol plant in Indiana. Bluff, I want to say it was Bloomington in Bluffton, Indiana. Sorry. Um, again, with the whole run through power, there's a Canadian national unit in the in the um, trail here. The other thing is, is that this is an ES. 40 DC, I want to say. It's not one of the AC units. And again, notice the ballast is nice and clean. And also, you can look at the farmland. Notice how they haven't harvested all, everything. It still has the, there's still stocks from the corn growing there. This was in a, this is NS143 taken a literally the next crossing to the east. And biggest reason you could tell was it was 143. 143 is Chattanooga, Tennessee to Elkhart, Indiana. No, sorry, I got that reversed. Elkhart, Indiana to Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, always has these white tankers, if you can see in the background where my mouse is circling. And what they are, are they are used for clay slurry. Um, they go down to a railroad down in Georgia and they get the clay slurry and they send it up north. Typically, you'll get batches of 10 to 15 in a con in a consist for 143. Always a fun train to shoot. So this was before was the after photo from the opening title sequence. This is an S200. Doesn't look like an NS, doesn't look like a typical NS train. You had CN run through power at this time at in 20, early 2017 was everywhere on the NS. You could almost bet on catching a train with Canadian Pacific run through power at this time. Um, and one of the things Gordy pointed out to me was I'm looking at this photo and he goes, that's an SD70 MI meaning it had the isolated cab, which is, you see that dark red that looks like there's a big gash on the side. That's part of the isolation of the locomotive cab to make it quieter and more comfortable for crews to ride on. And then in the background, I want to say that was a, maybe a Dash 9 or a um, Gevo. An ES44 AC, I should say. So another day, notice still snow. I want to say this was actually exactly a week later. And if it is, this was when it was so cold out that this and one other train was the only trains I got. And again, notice it's another one of them SD70 MIs. And the other thing to notice is this was taken right after sun, right before sunrise. Um. So NS200 well, is a Georgetown, Kentucky to Chicago, Illinois intermodal train. And this is actually one of the longer versions. I've seen it as short as three well cars or as long as this. More recently, they've added NS174 freight train to it, and they've done away with 174 due to the whole precision rarity that NS is implementing. So we've moved on and where the yellow stop right about here on the last one, we're now covering what I call Campbellstown, the Campbellstown siding area. This Campbellstown is a small town, literally one stop sign and that's it. But the biggest draw there is there is a passing siding for the NS. And it is, I want to say, 19,000 feet in length. Might be 20. I know they can pass almost anything on the district. And so 
this photo has been was stumping me for a while. I've been trying to figure out and trying to figure out and trying to figure out where this photo was. It's one of my all-time favorite photos I've ever ta I've taken because you got the train in the background and it's just this really dramatic shot of you know the train's coming. But we figured this out. This was east of Cam east of Campbellstown siding at the first grade crossing. Again, another one of my favorite photos of an NS train. This is NS-196, which is... Jordan, we've lost your audio, pal. Um, so, next thing... So, Jordan, Jordan, so we lost your audio from the beginning of NS-196. Okay, I kind of figured. Um, so, NS-196 was a... It still is. Is a Cincinnati... Cincinnati to Fort Wayne, Indiana manifest freight. It carries everything that the um that basically is needed between Fort Wayne and Indiana Fort Wayne Indiana and Cincinnati uh on this day it was actually a pretty lengthy train it had quite a bit of grain traffic from um consolidated barge down on the Ohio River um but this is one of my favorite shots as well because you got the sunrise coming up and it's just glinting off the side of the um, second locomotive. And then again, on another day, NS-196 was running quite a bit, was running a little bit late that day. I want to say it was running in about an hour late. And again, it's a train you could model for a small layout because you have your well cars at the back, you have a covered hopper, a gondola, a bulkhead flat, and then a tank car, and then two dash nines, which scale trains um, have made both paint schemes actually. Again, dash nines are synony synonymous with NS. This was actually taken in the same location in light. So, this photo. This photo was taken, and it's another one of them, me being, um, me trying to do something different. And so me and Ryan pull up to this crossing, and we see the train sitting there. And I'm like, oh, this is cool. Well, these light, this light was not produced by a flash, was not produced by another car. This light was produced by a combined harvester that they were using to get the rest of the stuff out of the field. And this photo is completely unedited. And the train was M43, NS M43, which in NS um, vocabulary, that's basically an extra section of NS143. Um, so they were here waiting on a freight. I want to say it might have been 216 this day, this morning, but. Notice the stars. That's the main thing is that this photo was not edited. I try not to edit any of my photos when I take them. And then so the next one is after NS1 is after NS216 passed. And if you notice right there it was set at such a delay to where the the M1 the M43 was not moving, which it captured, but it blurred everything else, such as the freight train going off into the distance. Um, that was that engine right there is an SD seventy M for the Union Pacific, and the one behind it is an SD seventy ACE. I believe it was one of the. It was at that point, 
they were built in 2012 for the NS. So this right here is photo. I would have liked to have gotten it a little bit farther back, but the biggest thing that I liked about this was you got the conductor waving. And this is NS215. NS215, mass it is a very profitable train for the NS. It is Chicago, Illinois to Atlanta, Georgia, and it is actually one of the hottest trains on the railroad. There have been numerous times where this train gets delayed and you have a higher up on NS calling and asking why this train's been delayed. The locomotive is an ES44 AC in the same numbering range as the NS heritage units, the GEs. And one of the biggest things that are so interesting about this is, is notice the nose cut out. There's a hole, there's a plate put in here, but you notice the indent in the nose. GE back in 2012, when NS approached them to start building these locomotives, said, we're going to give you, we, we will under, you will pay more to put the headlight and stuff up here, up above the cab, because typically GE puts it down here on the nose in the nose. NS puts it up there for numerous reasons. One of the biggest ones I have always heard is that NS is that those bulbs get really hot. And NS does not want crew members burning their arms when they're going past the locomotives to dismount for any numerous reasons, crew changes, doing switching, whatnot. And again, in the background, actually in the background, that is a ES-40 DC, meaning locomotive has DC traction motors, which up until 2010, 2011, NS did not, was an all DC railroad. They thought it was better to have that than have AC power. And so, this is NS25A, Chicago, Illinois to Danville, Kentucky. And, well, actually, Georgetown, Kentucky, I'm sorry. And this traffic, this train carries a lot of traffic for Toyota down in Georgetown. It carries a lot of the auto parts that they bring in from out west. And this was taken the same day as the CN photo from earlier in the presentation, the CN200. Um, at sunrise, and I will tell you this, it was negative 15 out that day, and there was a wind chill that had brought it down to negative 25, and I took this photo, got back in the car, my friend Ryan's sitting there, and he goes, how, he goes, how are you doing? I said, well, I can't feel my feet, I'm freezing, I said, I think we're going to call it a day, and we headed home. But both those units, I believe the one in the back might be a Dash 9, and the one in the front is an ES-44 AC, I believe. I'm not very up-to-date on my um, BNSF units. So here comes the biggest section of pictures. This right here is where... I spend more of my time photograph doing photography. And it's from Eaton, Eaton, Ohio to Somerville, Ohio. Somerville's not, not even a, it's a small town. I mean, it's typical of this area. You're in rural Ohio, rural Western Ohio, and the trains move. Um, Camden has a passing siding that has a, crossing in the middle so when they have to meet trains they sometimes have to cut this crossing so this is just outside the west end of Campbellstown siding I mean Camden si the siding at Camden and as you can see it's still cold it's very cold out that day I want to say it was maybe 16 at most 
Um, biggest thing about this, it's a former Conrail Conrail unit. Um, it's a former Conrail Dash 8, which is now gone from the NS rosters. Um, biggest one, reason you can tell, is there's a cutout in the plow for the third rail operations in New York City. The other reason is the number boards are mounted not on the up above where the headlights are, but down by the nose. And the ditch lights are underneath the pilot. But if you notice, the other things to notice is the right away here. You have all this ballast that it has cascaded down over time, and you got the different layers. Like you have the lighter layers and then the darker layers. And again, NS 142 was another one of these trains that you would always catch in the morning. Around this time, which was 2016 to 27, 2018, there was a very good chance of you catching NS 143, NS 174, NS. 215 and it's 142 and i just started you people ask well how did you get to know these numbers i started listening and i have a scanner that allows me to hear what the railroads are doing and it allowed me to start piecing together information such as oh this train's ns 143 I wonder where that goes. So I would type it in and it would tell me, oh, it's uh, Elkhart, Indiana to uh, um, Birmingham, Alabama or Chattanooga, Tennessee. So we're back to the snow. And this is one of my favorite places to photograph, but I wish I would have gotten a, the train snuck up on me, to be honest. It's downhill. It's uphill going this way, but with the falling snow and everything, it muted the train. Um, but there's a lot to see in this photo. Again, notice how the right of way is. Right of ways come sloping down. Their ballast is nice and tight again. This is maybe a half a mile from the previous photo. But again, notice the Union Pacific locomotive. It's a AC. Uh, notice the Union Pacific locomotive. It's an AC 6000. Um, and then you got behind it another one of the ES44 ACs in the 800 series, the 8000 series. But what's even more interesting behind it is there is a Canadian National SD70 M-2. So if you were modeling this in, in, this in HO scale, you could model everything. In, in scale, you could model everything, but you'd have to do some work for the CN unit. So this was taken about three weeks later. And another interesting thing is I actually know for a fact the first two locomotives are no longer on the NS roster. The Dash 9 was rebuilt into a AC-66 MCM, which is basically, they took it, they converted it from a DC direct current locomotive to an alternating current locomotive. And NS is doing that with a lot of their Dash 9 fleet to get more maintenance, um, more miles out of them. The second locomotive is an SD70M-2. And from all the crew, from every NS crew I've talked to, they hated all, they hated those locomotives. They were loud, they were noisy, and they rode horrible. Um, again, notice this is actually in the siding for, this train is passing the siding, if you can see the signals that are the block indicators for Campbell, Camden siding. Um, but the boxcars, doors are left open. Um, it's interesting to see how they do it. And the locomotive behind it is another 
ES40 DC. But it's interesting. They leave boxcar doors open. You got center beams that are empty at the head end of the train. It's really a mishmash of putting cars together. It's all organized, but it's... Hold on. There we go. Um, it's really... They ha it looks like chaos, but it's organized chaos. Come on. There we go. So this is, again, early, early f winter. In fact, I would almost consider this late, late fall, but it is actually early winter. But notice, again, with the consist, you got two dash nines and an e, a Union Pacific locomotive. In this time frame, you would get, you would have run through power from every, every Canadian, every class one railroad in the United States. I mean, I've seen Faramex, Canadian National, Canadian Pacific, but this is a grain train. Even into the middle of winter, you'll get these grain train extras going to places like Loudon, Tennessee, where they get converted into ethanol, or down to um, the docks at Savannah to be shipped overseas. So we've now entered summer. We've now entered another favorite area of mine. This is Somerville to Seven Mile, and there's a curve right here. This little curve right here is one of my favorite curves of all time just to photograph because as you'll see, you get a really nice view of the train. This was actually taken looking down. And again, here's another, like I said, this was taken in the same time frame. And you have two Canadian Pacific um, AC 6000s with a dash eight in the background in the um, center. And again, the reason you can tell is there's that, the um, number boards are below. And this was an NS60P, which is potash train out of Chicago, Illinois. It can run anywhere on the NS system, but I believe this one was built down to Louisville, Kentucky to be turned into fertilizer. And here it is on a brighter day. Um, nice thing about this curve, the farmer who owns the field is a very nice person. Um, there's actually a road that's directly behind me and he, he actually will mow the grass for me every once in a while so I can get these shots. But if you look here, there's so much, this is again NS-143. At this time, NS-143 was one of these trains where you knew it was coming in the morning around 9, 10 o'clock, and you could set up and photograph it. But notice, again, the details. You got here, you got two of the locomotives in their new, the new thoroughbred paint scheme. And you got one of the units in the older paint scheme. The other thing is, this unit still has a lot of its um, warranty stickers underneath. And there's other things like, several of the units when they were purchased had electronic air brake, electronic handbrakes, meaning you would do something in the cabin, it would set the handbrakes. Most of these units now have, um, now have been modified. They removed that and put just a regular handbrake on these units. And these are all dash nines, by the way. So this is Seven Mile. Seven Mile, Ohio is no, that whole valley, this whole valley, this is all in a valley. And there's a little creek that you can slightly see that runs up along there and it's called Seven Mile Creek. And when it's cold out and it's been humid, you get these amazing fog shots. This is, I want to say, an NS 
29J is what it's ringing, up, is ringing at. And the unit is actually one of the units that Atherin announced recently. Um, they are the SD-70 ACUs, which was NS back in the early 2012s, or early 2012, 2013. Was looking to buy as much used power as they could because they could rebuild it. They could rebuild the power at Juntianta Locomotive Shops in Altoona. And NS bought, I want to say, a hundred of these units from the Union Pacific, and re basically chopped the. They were SD90 AHs, I think. But they were having issues. Union Pacific had a whole bunch of them stored, and NS picked them up at a price that could not be beat. Um, and so what they did was they chopped the nose off, and EMD sent them basically the cab of a SD70 ACE. Created a really interesting loco looking locomotive. The trailing locomotive is an SD60E. Which, if you've ever seen pictures of the Norfolk Southern 911 or the Norfolk Southern 6920, those are SD60Es. The SD70 ACUs have all been sold off as of, there might be one running around, I think, still. But most of them have been sold off to Progress Rail to be scrapped or and parts taken out for reuse in other projects. And here's Seven Mile Ohio on a clear day. This is NS215. And this was the last time I ever, this was the second, this train was the last train I've ever shot with a SD60 standard cab, SD70 standard cab leader. And standard cab means unlike the Dash 9 behind it, you have a nose, the classic EMD SD, SD series nose. But you look at this, again, the ballast profile is wide, and it's a train of double stack containers. I want to say that might actually be one of the Conrail units that were purchased when the Conrail split happened that they built to Norfolk Southern specifications. Here's Seven Mile Ohio looking the other way. It's NS200 again. And NS200, great train to model because it was always typically very short. I mean, if it was 10,000 feet, if it was 10,000 feet, it was normal. Um, but again, it's a Dash 9, but this time it's a BNSF Dash 9 in the Heritage 1 paint scheme. Um, Scale Trains actually does make this unit as well, and so do quite a, a few other manufacturers. And here it is on, here's NS 143 on a little bit frostier morning. I mean, 142, I'm sorry. Um, and so, if you notice, you have one of the ES44 ACs, a Dash 9, and then another ES44 AC. Um, and then if you look back here, this is a flat car load of piping. So, we move on from Seven, Somerville, and we go through Hamilton, and from Butler Street, which is this connection right here, down to Rialto Road is where most of these photographs were taken. I believe there might be two from the Norfolk Southern Dayton District, which is this line that runs the this line that runs up this way. And that line runs Cincinnati to Columbus, Ohio, through Dayton, Ohio. So We'll start out at Airport Road. And I had I was showing photos one night and I was showing and Speed goes, What is this? And I said, 
that right there is so that when they are cleaning out this ditch, they do not strike those pipes. But this photo, you could not replicate except for this middle locomotive. This is a Conrail, S this is a former Conrail SD80 Mac. And in the background is a one of the leaser um, is one of the NS units that they bought during the power spree they went power buying they went on. That is an SD seventy. That is an SD sixty M. Both those two locomotives are gone from the roster. The SD eighties were sold earlier this year, and the SD sixties were sold last year. And these orange hopper cars behind. Those are all maintenance of weight ballast cars. And judging from the time of day, I would I would actually almost imagine this is probably an S143 out of Elkhart, Indiana. So here's an S215 again. Again. Saw this and I had to go after it. It's an SD70 and it this curve is on a soup is it's a series of S curve. But it's all on super elevated tracks. So the trains run here through here at 55 miles an hour and they're they lean into the curves. It's actually a very neat place. And this is um Seward Road is what the road's called. And the barn in the background. Perfect example of a rural American Ohio barn. But you're actually if you would go right across the tracks and look down, they're starting to urbanize this area and put subdivisions in. So we're at the east end of Crescentville siding. And this is actually an, a CXX train on the NS. And between Cincinnati Ohio, from between Winton Place, Ohio, and um, Hamilton, Ohio. Any trains that are going up to Toledo or Fort Wayne, Norfolk Southern and CXX, go up the CXX line, go up this line. And they meet right back here. Any southbounds come down this way and go down the NS. It's bi-directional running, and it's been that way since 2001. It basically saves time on the cruise, and it saves time on the... Um, it basically saves from having to try to pass trains and that. Both the CXX is double track, but the NS is not. And this is actually, an, and like I said, notice the nose headlight. The headlights cut out. The headlights where GE likes to have it compared to... Compared to having it like that, having it up above the cab, so as I said, I had a lot of surprises, and this is actually one of the this is n s one twenty three out of Frankfurt, Indiana too um well, it used to go to um, Charlotte in Charlotte, North Carolina, over the old Forts Loops. It's no longer does that. It goes over the goes down to Chattanooga now. But notice the nose. There's you can actually see it really good. And I sh should have remembered this is that there's the cutout there. This is one of the 20 heritage units NS painted up in the 2012 in 2012 to commemorate the 30th anniversary of Norfolk Southern. And they're always fun to catch. I mean, it it adds variety to rail fanning, and even if you don't see one, it's still fun to see one every now and again. So, like I said, this is on the Norfolk Southern New Dayton District. This is LI12, which was AK Steel, Middletown, Ohio to Sharonville, Ohio. It's a local. And all it carries is it carries 
steel. It carries these coils, and they get put on in um, freights going down south. But this train that passing. As you can see, I swung around and I saw the other train coming. I did not get a good photo of the meet. But all three locomotives, this is a Dash 9. The other, the one was a Dash 9. That's a Dash 9. But this is NS-170. NS-170 is a Chattanooga, Tennessee to Conway, Pennsylvania, right outside Pittsburgh. And it's mixed freight. It carries. This is the train that, if anything's coming north out of, out of Chattanooga with special power or unique locomotives, this is the one they transfer a lot of the motive power going up to Altoona, Pennsylvania. And in fact, tomorrow's NS-170 has one of the Union Pacific Heritage units on it. So, this is NS-376. <clears throat> After midway into 2017, NS went, this is actually early part of 2017, NS went, we're shifting 376 and 375, which were Bellevue, Ohio to St. Louis, St. Louis, Missouri freights. They took the roundabout route onto the Dayton District. But this photo, the last two photos were taken over on this little hillside over here. I climbed up the hill and shot down. And it just shows the run through power. I mean, you got a Union Pacific locomotive, and then behind it, a tier four CXX tier four unit with its um cabin this is actually one of with the um slanted radiators this is actually one of the newer ones that does not have the box on the front like in fact here's one of the cn um tier 4 units and if you can see there's that box that box was meant because they ge when they built these units thought they were going to need the space for clearance. And then the story goes is that CXX took one of these units because they had them like this. And CXX was, um, they realized they didn't need it, but they left it because it's easier to leave it that way. And CXX took one of these units and put it through a coal load, a coal load out down in Kentucky and scraped the scraped the um nice clean scraped the nice clean edges off the sides and GE basically started doing and you can barely just see it made everything slanted made everything slanted but this is one of the or um Gordy was telling me when I first showed him this picture that this was one of the first tier four units G, um, C, Canadian National got. And right over where my car was sitting is where the Westchester, Ohio's passenger station for the um, New York Central would have been. And this is a nice shot. I really like this shot. This is of the New York Central Heritage Unit. So when Norfolk Southern did it, did their heritage units, they did 10 GE units and 10 EMT units. And this train is a 60C, which is steel loads from Chicago, Illinois, well, Gary, Indiana, to, I want to say, Birmingham, Alabama, as well. And the nice thing about these trains is once they got the power, you always had the same power for a couple of weeks. I'm, I think this was the first time it ran, and I caught it two other times, but nowhere near as nice as this shot. This is in front of Gilkey Windows down in Champion Windows down in Cincinnati, and 
The only thing I regret about this photo is that off to the screen over off to the left right hand left hand side of the photo three ducks land three canadian geese landed and it disrupted the water enough otherwise it was perfectly still i could have got a crystal clear shot of the locomotive and one of ns's famous rebuilds of an s this is an sd60e with its crescent cab and the crescent cabs were designed to be more crash protect more crash worthy than a normal standard cab and supposedly more comfortable. Crews would beg to differ on that one. So this is an interesting photo. Montpelier, Indiana, which is way north on the um, Norfolk Southern's um, Newcastle district. That is a that is the Union Pacific's 1996 1989 heritage unit of the Rio Grande. That is a grain train they are putting together. It's a 42G. Montpelier has this massive grain grain um, mill up there, and I heard got a call from my friend at like 12 o'clock saying. This unit had arrived up in Fort Wayne the night before, and I'm like, oh, well, it's probably going to go back out on a train heading back towards St. Louis. I get a frantic phone call. Uh, no, they're sending it south. They got it going down to, um, it's going down to Montpelier to pick up a grain train. So I'm, I'm at work, and I took a sick, I had to leave for an emergency because it's not every day you get a, Union Pacific Heritage Unit out this way leading. And I grabbed my friend Ryan and we started heading north. And we got halfway up there. It was a three, it was a two and a half hour drive. And my phone calls, my phone starts ringing going, they just sent the power back up to Fort Wayne. They're going to spin it. And I said, are you sure? He goes, yeah, I'm on my way up there. Something just lined itself. So we have something called ACTS, and it's a computer program that allows you to see where trains are if you if they are running using a certain type of signaling system. And um, I know so everybody was worried because this tra a train had appeared coming out of the yard out of the out of Montpelier siding, going back north. What it had been was it had been a local that had ducked in there while this crew was still working the side, working Montpelier, the grain mill at Montpelier. And I get up there thinking, well, it might not even be up here. And there was 20 or 30 cars up here in this little town, in this little road. And everybody was lined up getting photos. And... He pulled, he got his train together. This is right past the siding. He's actually still pulling his train out of the grain industry. He pulled down there and he sat for three hours until it was dark. And when he made, came down through Cincinnati, it was still dark. So we're now south of the river. These were, these are. Jordan, we're at. We've got about six minutes left till we've got to put the next clinic on. Okay. That's good to know. Do we have questions? We do. I'm going to just, I've got, we've got a lot of questions, but I'm just going to pick the bigger, bigger ones, the ones been asked the most. Okay. Um, so what camera do you use and lenses um, and stuff? At this point, it was a Nikon T T6i. Um, and all these were shot without a tripod. Um, but now I have gotten a Canon D350, which the reason I switched over was that my Canon T6i had some, um, started having some problems where it wasn't able to keep up with nighttime photography, doing photography, and I had to deal with this, um. I decided just to jump over and get a newer camera. Okay, cool. 
Uh, what's your number one tip for people that are thinking about going rail fanning in winter? Dress warmly. Make sure you have a cell phone on you that, and have a car charger on you in case you would get stuck. And the, I, I actually always have three tips. And bring extra batteries for your camera. Oh, cool. Um, okay. Did you need permission to take any of these photographs? Um, so most of these photographs are taken on public land. There's only one that was not, and that was this one. That was the NS Heritage Unit photo. That was taken at a parking lot, and I asked the um, people inside if it was okay to park here. But most of them are on access. You walk, you park, and you walk into the shots. Like for these are all on public land. Um. This was actually taken from from the road, but this one, I parked way down there and walked in for this shot. So, as most of the time, as long as you are not on, as long as you're not standing right around here, you're fine. But be aware that certain areas out here, most people know my cars. In other places, you would have problems, more like in Chicago and that. So cool. keep that in mind. Okay, cool. Um, and so final question, and then we're going to move on for the next clinic. Um, are the lines that you showed to the west of Hamilton, were they CTC or uh, ABS track warrants? So, um... Hold on. So the line, let's see if I. So this line that's going this way is ABS track warrant. It is the Cincinnati to Indianapolis, Indianapolis sub. It actually starts in Hamilton. At one point, I actually lived a block away from this line. This line going up this way is. Um, C is NS's version of CTC. It's a mixture of the sidings are CTC, but the intermediates are ABS. Cool. All right. Well, uh, Brad, if we can, uh, Jordan, if you can stop sharing, we're, we're, we're on our time. So uh, thank you very much. We don't have the Australian spin the bottle game today. Um, as people may have noticed, they call it the wheel of chat, but reminds me too much of sandpaper, which for Australian cricketers is a bad thing. So what we're going to do, though, talking to Australians, is we're going to be right back in a couple of minutes uh, with Jerry Hopkins, MMR, uh, who's from Australia, or lives in Australia, he may not be from Australia, um, and uh, he's going to give us a clinic on uh, locomotive and rolling stop maintenance. So while we do that, in the chat, I'd like you to uh, give us your feedback on whether you want to see more rail fanning clinics like the one you've just done where we talk about how you can model the trains that you see because Jordan's got about 7,000 pictures to show us. So let us know. If so, we'll get one lined up for January. Give us your feedback. We're always interested to hear what you have to say. We'll be right back. Mm -hmm. 